Boa tarde a todos. É com muito prazer que eu dou início ao painel. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to begin our panel academic spin-off, reality and challenges in our country. I'd like to thank the attendance of all our speakers. And this panel brings together renowned Brazilian experts in the area of science, technology, and innovation who are going to present real stories, talk to us about the challenges they have faced and others that they believe they may have to face in the future. Their uh, technological work, together with universities or in companies where they work, may work as structures that may mobilize regional uh, economic uh, and scientific development, generating wealth for our country. An academic spin-off uh, is a company that is created to explore generated knowledge after research performed in laboratory or uh, offices of an academic institution. One, uh, some of the characteristics have been reported in the literature and also in Brazilian innovation legislation. Companies that uh, were created in universities and that will explore patents, technology innovations, or any other kind of knowledge that is produced in university research. Uh, uh, profit or non-profit, or that have an important impact on social development. And uh, usually, they work again from dissertations or uh, thesis presentations, uh, papers or works, or research, among other academic works. Many uh, went through incubators and some of them are considered unicorns because they have been uh, assessed in one billion dollars before going uh, opening IPO. I'm going to give the floor to André Ribeiro de Oliveira at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is going to co-moderate this panel with me, and he's going to introduce the speakers before their presentations. Professor André, he is Associate Professor of the Department of Industrial Engineering at uh, the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He, uh, he graduated at the Federal University, he has an MBA also, he is a master and has a, holds a PhD at COP in the area of management and innovation. He is currently a professor of the permanent uh, faculty of the uh, Higher School of Design and the My Dai program generated by the State University's Management School. He has a lot of experience in production engineering with an emphasis in managerial strategy. He has worked in innovation, entrepreneurship, design, and business design. Thank you. So, Professor André, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to participate, co-moderate this very important panel with Professor Branca. We have worked uh, together in many projects uh, since 2010, and I'd also like to thank the attendance of all our guest panelists, and so I will begin by introducing our first speaker. Well, the list, the original list, included Professor Nivio Ziviani. Unfortunately, he will not be able to attend due to health health issues. He is well, but he was not able to be here with us. He is Emeritus Professor from the Computational Department of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, member of the Board of Konomi, uh, and consulting uh, 
board, PhD in computer science, and member of the Brazilian Academy of Science and the National Order of the Scientific Merit. And he is an entrepreneur. He has already created companies from the knowledge generated. And he is the author of algorithms and co-authors of over 180 scientific articles in the fields of algorithm and artificial intelligence. So we are going to begin then with Professor Leopoldo Gomes Muraro. He is a master in public administration. He is also an MBA from the FGV. He is a federal prosecutor. And he coordinates the Forum of Prosecutors in the Chamber of Science, Innovation of the Federal uh, Prosecutor's Office, and uh, also innovation in Unuhiu. Unuhiu. After Mr. Muraros, we're going to have Juliana Crepaldi. She has holds a PhD in technological innovation. She is executive coordinator of technology transfer and innovation, technical director of the Innovation uh, Managers Forum, a member of the board of the Commercial Chamber of Minas Gerais and the board of Tech Town of Intellectual Property and Tech Transfer. And then we shall hear Professor Lilian Carretti. She has a, holds a PhD in business administration at the University of Sao Paulo. She, her grad, undergraduate course is from the University of Sao Paulo. She worked as a professor of MBA courses at St. Paul's Institute of Finance. She is professor of finance and at the uh, School of Economy and under graduation and uh, graduate courses. And she works with research and investment in venture capital. She works in USP, uh, USP's agency as an advisor of the field of entrepreneurship, coordinating work with startup companies and venture capital, in addition to presenting solutions developed by the startups in companies with technological challenges. She's also president of the investment uh, committee, and she has authored many uh, books. She also worked as an uh, advisor for valuation, uh, pricing of assets, and she also worked in banks and international operations with uh, fundraising. In closing our presentations in this panel, we'll hear Dr. Egas Caparelli Moniz de Aragão Daque. He is from a graduate course of the State University of Rio de Janeiro and doctor from this university. He is a physician and uh, he concluded his courses in the U.S. in 1990. He is associate uh, professor on physiology at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and he is associate professor of uh, clinical medicine of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Unihil. He coordinates the residency there, and he is full member of the Brazilian Academy of Neurology, and he has a specialist uh, title in traffic medicine, and he works with neurophysiology, neuromodulation, and he also researches neuromodulation, traffic medicine, and transit psychology.
And so let us begin our lectures, beginning with Mr. Leopoldo Gomes Muraro. E, so, Mr. Muraro, you have the floor. Thank you, André. I'd like to thank uh, Branca, Professor Branca, a very interesting theme for our country, encouraging our relationship with the spin-offs. Can you see my screen? I'm going to minimize here, otherwise I won't be able to see anything. Okay. I'm going to talk about spin-offs in Brazil, opportunities and challenges. First of all, I'm going to give an overview of uh, CTNI in Brazil, uh, science, technology and innovation in Brazil, and some legal instruments. I'm going to show you a graph since it's an international uh, event, it's interesting to put our status into context here. It is still, we have a very typical uh, characteristics. First of all, we see here the GDP, and because of the pandemic, it has changed. The Brazilian GDP was growing together with the other countries. Brazil improved their, its spin-offs, or rather its publications, publication output. Our papers grew in number, our articles are producing a greater impact, we improved our figures in masters and uh, doctors, master's degrees and PhD courses, but we are not able to transform this into intellectual property. So, just goes to show the importance of encouraging spin-offs and technology-based uh, companies, the importance that this has for the country. We have not yet overcome this stage. A more recent example, 2019, Brazil and South Korea, in terms of papers published, we would be almost equal as South Korea. But in, according to the USPTO, uh, patents granted by the USPTO, South Korea is way ahead of us. And this reflects the global innovation index. And we have to, as a nation, we have to stimulate and find the means to encourage our technological research so we can improve uh, intellectual property in our country. So in this context, we have to change our culture. And on the state side, a new administrative legal framework. In 2015, there was uh, the Constitutional Amendment number 85, and then in the following year, 2016, new legislation, 13,243, that changed the, uh, uh, changed the innovation laws and a decree. So there is a legal framework. Our legislation today is appropriate for science, technology, and innovation. And we are now producing internal norms and orders to put all this into practice. Now we have to change our culture and the ways that we work. I name this article, this, this article here, the Union of the States and the Federal District and the municipalities. So 
All the Brazilian uh, order says that the union, the states, the federal district, and the municipalities shall sign cooperation uh, agreements with uh, public entities or agencies and with private entities, sharing human resources, specialized human resources, and install capacity. So it, there is this constitutional order so that these agencies and these uh, cooperation instruments, with all this, we can create an ecosystem of innovation in our country, creating a scientific technological innovation development. The theory that this, uh, the legal framework is based on was this idea of the triple helix model for innovation, and this arose through partnerships for what purpose? To achieve economic and social development and growth, and all this founded on knowledge. How are we going to create the means in order to interact with a government fostering part of this, the universities creating growth? and all this knowledge of being applied to companies so in order to enhance innovation in our country now moving on to the legal instruments there is a legal instrument that is used but it should be improved which is technological request order we are using it now because it is a challenge for us it's part of the right especially based on law 666 if you're going to have a existing product this uh, technological contract or order is a challenge for the government to pay research in order to reach a given product, and then, which is uh, Brazilian law's greatest challenge today, is to have everyone understand that we are paying for something that does not exist. Our colleagues, uh, prosecutors, say, how are we going to order a product that doesn't even exist? And when it exists, if it exists, we're going to state that we're going to buy this product? We have been working a lot with this. In other words, scientific discoveries through research and scientifically, oftentimes even the negative result is relevant. But we you see that sometimes you have to change the whole research study. This is valid from the scientific point of view. However, in the legal aspect, we have to do rearrangements so as to have all of the control system accept legal instruments whereby the state will pay, will invest in the study, and when there is a commission, if it is successful, the state will buy. The AstraZeneca vaccine was a very clear case of this. When the vaccine was still in stage three, the government paid. And when the vaccine were approved, then we would have the right to get uh, part of the doses and then be part of the patent. So commissioning or contracting is an instrument that has to be given more value today. There is a document that is being drafted for uh, the purchasing of the vaccine. In any case, I believe it is, would be useful to start using this instrument in our country. It is a moment for the state to go ahead and encourage research that when they have their results, the state may buy that one product that is still out in the future. With regard to instruments that are consolidated, there is a permanent chamber for science and technology. We are nine people and we 
prepare drafts of such instruments. We have seven prepared instruments. We have a number of the so-called other agreements for the promotion and fostering of innovations. The second one here is the acquisition or commissioning of products or services for research and development. There is an international cooperation agreement model. In other words, we already have a ready-made uh, model for that should this occur and then we have the technological bonus i'm going to touch on that we have the grants from for using the laboratories equipment instruments and materials and finally contracts that involve the transfer of technology in other words how will this be done through licensing or others so we are already contemplating all of these possibilities i'm going to give this uh, presentation to you and so you can even disseminate it and publicize it if you wish. So th this is what we have. We have, first of all, a legal uh, opinion defining and giving the foundations for the legal application of each instrument. Then we have the legal instrument draft, which is a template with the instrument structure. And then finally, a checklist. In other words, when you have such a case, what will you do? Some will need technical notes from the TTO, or really it depends on each product. But all of these instruments are ready, so the different agencies are already following this standard. I was talking with people from CNI, which is the industry of the Brazilian Industry Confederation. Everybody there is also preparing themselves. The idea is, I'm going to come back here. These are the seven instruments. I would like to apologize. All of this should be on our website, but because we are now migrating, I preferred to bring this over. I'm going to give this over to you so you may distribute it as you uh, think, think is fit. So for the first thing, it is using labs. In other words, current legislation today allows for all laboratories in public universities or research institutes such as Fiocruz, the company may come in and make use of that lab structure. Oftentimes, it may even be a spin-off. They're small, they don't have the money to set up their own lab. So if they need to make a test, if they make, need to make use of some kind of material, they may sign an agreement with the university and make use of that lab. We have three types of agreements, from the simplest one to the more complex one. Let's say that I need to do one or two tests, and I just need a permission or an authorization. If it is a more complex uh, structure, like working for the whole year, so we have uh, we will deal with something more complex, which would be like a what we call a concession. Thus, spin-off companies may have access to lab structures in public institutions. In other words, it is that uh, it is therefore seeded for such use. The second instrument is the service provision contract. Same thing here. The company may contract with the university technology services. In other words, the university is going to be providing services in that company. It is the public entity providing services to the private. Entity. This really is not ordinary in our Brazilian legislation. Usually, the private will pay to have access to services provided. In this case, 
this is what this instrument allows for. And finally, we have the so-called technological bonus. This is new. I think this is really good. It is very important for spin-off companies. The government wants to come back and incentivize this even more. This would be like innovation vouchers, as we see them in the UK and in other European countries. This is for micro companies or small and average size companies, wherever there are such spin-offs. The legislation contemplates three hypotheses. First, paying to share infrastructure, just like I've just shown you, an agreement between a spin-off company and the university. In this case, we do have a model for this. The concession term, for example, is used to pay fellowships, scholarships, and other economic uh, subsidies. But in this case, it is different. Resources may be given to a spin-off, and with, with this, these resources, the spin-off company will be able to pay the university in order to share their lab and their infrastructure. But there are these four possibilities in the legislation. Sharing infrastructure, using infrastructure, contracting expert technological services and for technology transfer. Let's say that the spin-off company needs a patent or some kind of know-how. It is possible to acquire this technology. So this is contemplated in Article 26 of Degree 9283, dated from 2018. This is what I had for you. Uh, I thank you. Let's hear our colleagues. Professor Leopoldo, thank you so much for your excellent explanation. Now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Juliana Capaldi. She will speak about innovation policies in partnerships between universities and companies in Brazil. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin. Christine Branca and Andrea, thanking you for this invitation to be here. And I'd also like to greet my colleagues on this panel. Before I begin, Andrea, you said that Professor Nivio Ziviani will not be able to attend today, but I did bring some of his experience, and I will use that to il illustrate some of our cases. So somehow some of his, his own topics will be addressed in our presentation here today. Can you see my screen? Yes. Very well, then. We are now at an event that discusses triple helix, right? The role of university, industry, and government. And my goal here today is to speak about from the perspective of the university. In other words, the need to support technology-based endeavors. As André said, I work at the Minas Gerais University in the in Technology Innovation Department. And among different initiatives that we have, we support these initiatives. Our TTO gives support and fosters this interface between the university and companies. A few words about how the creating and consolidating technology-based and, and, uh, endeavors are so important for the progress of innovation and technology in the different countries. So this issue is very much debated about new endeavors and initiatives that will emerge. This type of initiative, this type of strategy as a state policy, what does it aim at? It aims at co collecting 
the scientific and technology capacity of one region, making the connection with the ability for new businesses in that region so that the country can consolidate its innovation system and also aiming, of course, at social and economic development. I am going to speak about spin-offs, which is our topic in this panel, but this must be necessarily connected to national and regional practices for industrialization. In other words, a state policy that aims at fostering economic activities based on technology initiatives. Of course, there must be a, an interface with industrial policies. So when you have this interface, let's bring this to our university universe. And when I say university, I'm not talking about university themselves, but also research centers. Of course, this interface will then be increased. The infrastructure that the country can consolidate and Mr. Leopoldo talked about this, the access that companies may have to uh, research center structures. So, of course, these must be consolidated and perfected in the country. The legislation, and I'm going to touch about the legal framework for science and technology in Brazil, but this legal framework will allow for the relations between private and public to occur more smoothly, not in a way as to meet the pace that is the pace required for technology innovation and accelerated pace. This type of activity creating spin-offs will also uh, train human resources, it will attract human resources and retain them to our country from the research center axis. This means that they have a new mission besides uh, the capacity building and training of human, human resources which really are the mission of universities. But beyond this capacity building, beyond the development of uh, research for technology impacts, the university also plays another role, which is to collaborate with the national innovation system through supplying infrastructure and knowledge in such a way as to support the generation of spin-offs, for example. What the interesting point here is that although this may be an action that should be included in the institutional mission, for the research centers, they consider this their mission, their vocation, and it is in their DNA. We're going to speak about their policies, and Mr. Leopoldo showed us the pyramid, the way how the legal framework is built for innovation. And amongst the different instruments that the university has, we have the policy for innovations, and this is where we're going to deal with supporting technology innovation. All of this will strengthen the role played by universities in the triple context. So when we think about developing countries such as Brazil, we don't have favorable environments for innovation. This is so for different re uh, reasons. So for our context, it, is, uh, it makes sense for the government to offer its support precisely to help those companies that work with risk that they be more successful in their endeavors and everything that has to do with innovation. So we do have an immature national system in Brazil, not very favorable to the business environment. So it is a goal to strengthen the role played by universities. And when we speak about competencies of the research centers, 
we will work based on three pillars. Intellectual capital, which is the knowledge generated by the research center, something that is accumulated over the years by its researchers. The technologies, which are the ones that are materialized and become patents, intellectual property, etc. And finally, infrastructure, which is so relevant for the research centers to bring their competencies, for example, to give their support to spin-off companies. This slide says that when we are speaking about the technology access, we are speaking more than about patents. There is know-how with economic value and legal value. For example, issues that are protected by patents, know-how, softwares, industrial designs. So there is a whole set of elements that is really the materialization of this intellectual capital. All, all of these assets can be negotiated with spin-off companies in in order to generate new businesses. I'd like to tell you about a recent experience at our university. We have licensed an industrial design to a spin-off. It was a jewel. You may well see that we, this was not the, uh, the regular type of endeavor. About the legal framework, what we do in the context of spin-offs, well, it will make legitimate for partnerships to work with more security and it, its guidelines indicate that Research centers and universities should support these initiatives, which means that the companies may have their innovation uh, projects open and they may go out of the company and look for the competencies they need in the university. The innovation uh, legal framework includes new laws and it also creates more structuring and more continuous way to participate and cooperate university and companies which in turn allows the spin-up companies to have more access to those competencies those pillars that i mentioned so this is something that was favored by the legal framework in the area of innovation. Interaction with companies. We do have a few possible models for this interaction, including the possibility for spin-offs to have access to these models. For example, uh, agreements for development, technology transfer, sharing infrastructure, etc. I had talked about technology innovation policies, and it has been included in the Brazilian legislation. I'd like to say this to our foreign audience. Brazil does have this legislation, and it was the choice of the legislature to present these instruments and these tools and allow for each research center and university to build their own innovation policy to see the way how they themselves will put this into practice. A few items are mandatory for public research centers, both from the strategic point of view and the normative point of view. Uh, they need to have instruments that will promote and support entrepreneurship. This is the result of a partnership between Fortec and our technology and science ministry. This is available online and it touches on the, these guidelines. With regard to the legal framework vis-a-vis spin-offs, spin-offs having and working with the researchers, well, there is this article 11 
that clearly allows for the university to license its intellectual knowledge to the company that might have as a partner one of the university elements. So this is a contract of technology transfer, and these contracts can be signed with those companies that have among their partners someone from that research center. And this will allow for some initiatives, such as the ones that are led by Professor Nidio Giviani. A few words about experiences by our Minas Gerais Federal University, so as to show you the way how our university is practicing this. First of all, within the, the research center policy, we built this resolution in 2018. In this uh, decree, I forgot to mention that it is possible as long as this innovation policy is complied with. So they can regulate internally and approve partnerships and uh, licensings for those companies that uh, have a researcher at the UFMG. This document is on the CTIT UFMG website. Now, what is interesting here that I'd like to bring to our discussion is that when this innovation policy was created, the university carried out a study to check whether it really made sense within its innovation policy to foster this kind of undertaking when the researcher was involved as a partner in that business. And to this end, a study group was created. I'm going to share with you very quickly the findings of this study. An analysis was uh, carried out, 32 cases of technology transferred carried out in five the five-year period. And in this study, we compared of the 32 companies, 12 of them had UFMG research researchers in their uh, partners, among their partners. And the companies were not uh, large sites companies, but they were similar to spin-off companies so that we could compare them. What did we observe? With the researchers, intellectual capital, what we observed is that in that same five-year period, those, those companies yielded 12-fold more royalties to UFMG compared to the companies that did not have UFMG researchers among their partners. And then we wondered whether this could jeopardize their work. And then what did we notice? In the production of articles and orient student orientation, uh, writing of book chapters or the production of articles, there was no negative impact for these researchers production, 11 of them had uh, scholarships, uh, 1A, 1B, which are very high levels for scientific production. And these professors generated within their businesses, they were able to capture as researchers, while still working as researchers, they were able to capture in five years' time, third, a little over 13 million reais for the Federal University, in addition to other results that also came up. Um, the hiring of people and also the graduation of uh, university students. So all this led the Federal University to validate uh, that their action it's action in academic spin-offs that have researchers as partners. This does add value given all the variables that we discussed previously. And within the Federal University of Minas Gerais, UFMG, 
of uh, UFMG's uh, entrepreneurial, there is the Fund de Pach. It's a venture capital uh, investment fund manager, and so it is an entrepreneurial capital company to support also the management of these companies. It is a seed for science manager, and the Fund de Pach it invests that company that works with artificial intelligence algorithms where the people and Professor Luiz Viani is one of the partners. So there's another initiative that UFMG has that participates, which is the technological the science park, a science park can be seen as a, an environment that promotes innovation and it gathers in addition to undertakings, it uh, also has within its structure, within its competencies, it provides support to companies that received technology from the university. Uh, like Konomi, Alamantec, Inventivision, they are all university spin-offs that are or were uh, within the Agatech, BH Tech. And there are two technology centers, the Technology Center for Vaccines and the Nano Technology Center, or CT Nano, and uh, Biotechnology. And and nano is in the area of nanotechnology. So uh, an innovation environment accommodates new innovation promoting environments within the different uh, uh, actions. And in closing my presentation, I'd like to explore the case of Kumumi. Kumumi. It is a company that works with uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. It can be applied in, it can have different applications for health, civil construction. So it is a technology platform. What's interesting in this case is, first of all, the uh, university's contract with Komumi was not to transfer a patent. This algorithm is know-how. So this just shows the need for universities and research centers to broaden their perspective and not uh, consider patents as the only form of expression of their intellectual property. The university can use, we are not paid, we're not paid, royalties, we just uh, receive a participation or a share. And at present, for universities, it is possible that they are partners. But this was just a test for them of the model so that the university could participate of these uh, undertakings. And there are researchers in this society. There, it just shows the importance of venture capital. Komumi is uh, included in the BH Tech. It is uh, installed within an environment that promotes innovation. It is uh, one that uh, invests, or, or their investments from Funepach. So, you know, all the links come together here. It has a partnership agreement contract by which uh, an artificial intelligence lab was created that uh, brings together researchers, students, and it has uh, the infrastructure for research. This uh, LIA, the LIA, this artificial intelligence lab, works within the university. Know-how patent last week, we made a deposit, a know-how deposit within the UFMG know-how bank. And as we also like to make different arrangements and work in new proposals, what are we negotiating now? Not the licensing or the transfer 
but the sale of this technology to the company as an exchange for our increase increasing our share and so only after 2016 were we able to for to have university not only licensing but also and to close this example it's a kind of collaboration with a spin-off that, uh, in addition to all the assets that I mentioned, it fosters the uh, training of human resources. So one sees that it is a continuous improvement and helps connect the research at the university with real demands, such as, for instance, the COVID observatory. 561,000 reais were invested for um, student scholarships. Now, in closing, some considerations. I think that there are lots of points for reflection. We may go into greater depth in the debate. The need that we observed here for a system of innovation in Brazil that should be included in our institutions in order to foster undertakings of this nature, in addition to uh, their skills. This is an, a challenge. We have started to work with this uh, theme at the university, and despite all the things I presented to you, we still face the challenge of developing practices to uh, deal with the conflict of interest. How can we minimize these conflicts, the participation of this uh, researcher in projects. So it's important to create. We have discussed this with the AGU and as a means to create a chamber to generate or to manage conflict of interest. All this uh, is a learning process and you're learning by doing. We can't stop to think about it and then only then practice, we sort of learn by doing. And, and that's it. And the last point that I'd like to present for our debate is that our national innovation system, which is the triple helix, it uh, comes from public and private investment, venture capital, and uh, so we noticed all the technological uh, orders that were mentioned before, venture capital, the private sector, the state's pro procurement demands, fiscal incentives, the role of regulatory agencies, and the legal framework. And the last point that we, uh, the startup legal framework was approved this week which will facilitate undertakings of this nature. Thank you. That is what I would have to share with you. Thank you, Dr. Juliana. Very interesting. Your presentation about uh, the experience the university working this idea of the uh, entrepreneurial university. Now we'd like to give the floor to Dr. Lilian Sanchez Carretti. Her lecture, Challenges of the uh, Entrepreneurial Scientist. Good, good afternoon, André. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Branca, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be able to share my afternoon with Juliana and Leopoldo and uh, uh, the sequence of presentation, the sequence was this order of presentations was very interesting because Leopoldo presented the regulatory and, and Liliana spoke about the FMG and I'm going to talk about our vision at the University of Sao Paulo, how we can encourage our academic spin-offs. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Okay, I'm going to talk about 
some of the challenges, the infrastructure of entrepreneurship, the ecosystem, science parks, and uh, incubators, the development of these startups. There is an enormous vocation to generate startups. And the 50 unicorns are the university students. So it is a vocation of the university to generate new companies and generate spin offs. We are calling them USP DNA unicorns. And so we are referring to university company partnerships. There are many examples of skills, of areas of science where we have partnerships with the university in research centers or in laboratories or to create a cohort status to implement entrepreneurship and so forth. So there is an environment that fosters innovation. But as the two speakers before me said, there's still a lot to do. We seek spin-offs when we seek these, we still find great difficulty in identifying them because oftentimes they grow regardless of any action by the university and when the spin-off is created from a given technology, there are these registries. But today, we can create new companies it may be there may be a connection with the market that is our vision of what we have to do with big companies and the investor the venture capital and these venture capital also. How do we see the difficulties and the friction so that the scientists can become entrepreneurs? The regulation of the um, public worker statute, it does not allow him to be the partner and a manager of a company. So the lack of knowledge by scientists of transforming their technology into a startup. And in addition to this, not only in becoming a startup, but also of having an agreement or performing a service. The researcher does not get enough uh, information to deal with and to connect uh, themselves with a company. They decide what their line of research is going to be from their own curiosity or a line of re scientific research, not necessarily what they are studying it may have a connection with some kind of market demand. So oftentimes there is a difficulty in connecting whatever is being developed in the lab with what the company really wants to bring into the market. It is also difficult to understand or identify what is it that the company wishes oftentimes. 
ela muitas vezes when the company contacts the university it just cannot make its mind about which type of research line it wishes to contract so there is this gap between the researcher and what the company really wants to move forward another difficulty is a difficulty in communication between the researcher and the company. The researcher's vision, the way he describes the technology and the way he wants to apply it to communicate this to the company. So there is a need for innovation, which usually is done by our TTO. There is also great difficulty on the part of the companies to identify. Professor William, I'm so sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, Professor William. Your audio is chopped. May I suggest for you to turn off your camera? Maybe your audio will improve. So sorry. It's because it was chopped. No problem at all. So yet another difficulty is the way how the company will have access to the technologies. In other words, which are the knowledge areas that can be accessed to meet the technological challenge of the company. Oftentimes, there is a need for different areas to meet that one challenge. And oftentimes, there is no knowledge about the paths that should be followed to reach those areas and to reach the researcher. And finally, difficulty to access capital, be it private capital or public capital. And here we can see that private capital is the one that we should be focusing on. So based on these diagnoses of the different challenges and difficulties by the researcher so that he will become a knowledgeable researcher on these matters, we have been defining a few actions that are now being implemented short and average term. First, we should focus in the training of that scientist. In other words, not have him not only having the competencies for his publications, his scientific work, but also train him in such a way as to enable him to transform that knowledge into innovation and to do so he must learn how to connect to the company he must really make an effort to contact the company hold meetings with the company uh, present services and initiate a commercial relationship with that company and based on all of this he will begin to understand what are the market demands and thus define what his research line should be maybe we should actually revert the process because it is so hard to be able to license something based on a patent or once the patent is given, how can you do the licensing? Well, maybe then we should understand the need of the market and then define the technology development per se. For this connection to happen between the scientists and the market, the university, our university is implementing a few events. We have SciBiz, for example, it is a meeting between science and business, and there we make the connection, the link in the same space. Last year it was on site, but this year it's 
going to be online. So we're going to place together start up, start apps outside the university and also within the university incubators and scientists fostering and helping them develop their entrepreneurial skills so they will have these skills and competencies for the market. So inside the university, we bring the technologies through the technology showroom, startups through startup uh, fairs and meetings, thus having contact with the market so they can get to understand these uh, companies and also private investors with venture capital and also the angel investor who will come in at the very first stage in the startups life cycle. SciBiz actually is not a Sao Paulo University event. It is actually in favor of the university. We want to incentivize the participation of scientists in startups from anywhere in the state of Sao Paulo or Brazil. So I'd like to take this opportunity to make an invitation to all of those who are here with us to see this as a point of connection with the market. Our goal here is to develop science in our country. And finally, we also have an event. It is, we have an yearly event, but we do have the need for a developed technology to connect academia and market. This is my third point here. This is where I need a system with some sort of intelligence, which will be presented in an attractive or palatable to the market, the technologies. It will be a technological platform. And then there, I'll give the scientist space and room for him to introduce himself and present his work in startups as well. So companies can identify on this platform and map out the available technologies, be they developed by scientists or be they at another higher stage already offered by startups. I'd like to say that SciBiz will be held from June 14 to 18, and again, it's not exclusive to the Sao Paulo University. It is from the Sao Paulo University for everyone in Brazil. So we are going to have keynote speakers from Triple Helix, but also will include other topics. And those products and the the last initiative that we're looking at has to do with technology. In other words, we try to bring together all of these players that you can see here on the screen and put them in connection to each other. Then, of course, you can say, but who comes first, the egg or the chicken? Should I, should I present technology to the market or should the market present their demand? And this is precisely what we want here. It does not really matter in what way this moves. We have to foster this movement both ways. In other words, the academia should present their experience and technology, but the and then going to make a call which one would be more efficient. And then in this case, we can have initiatives moving in both directions, everything to foster spin off creation. And thus,
essa é a nossa é a nossa hipótese e a gente está pronto This para is our hypothesis e, and we are ready to test it in the years ahead and who knows we may have new results to present to you based on these solutions thank you so much for listening and I am available for questions thank you Okay, Dr. Lilian, obrigado. Very well then, Dr. Lilian, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Questions will be received at the end. We are going to hear Professor Angus, and after that, we're going to open our Q&A and the debate session of our panel. All right? Bom, então, dando continuidade... Very well then. Let us pursue. This is the last presentation by Professor Egas Caparelli. Structuring a spin-off in the State University of Rio de Janeiro with the My Guy program. You have the floor, Professor Ingalls. Thank you very much, André, for your introduction. Let me share my screen. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, Professor Branca, André, and all the team for this invitation. Actually, this presentation is like a testimony on the experience that I have had. I really want to thank you also because this is a great opportunity to educate myself through these wonderful presentations because I myself experience things, uh, uh, things that I have been thinking through over this process. So I heard these experiences that I've been going through, I heard them now being technically presented. I've had discussions with André and Marisa and Branca about the structuring of this project. And we have always said in jest that I am what we call here in Brazil a lab rat. In other words, this presentation could be entitled impressions of that lab red because i i do have a scientific training but now my experiences are all like uh, lab mouses or rats but anyway i'd like to thank you and professor branca and myself we have won the state University for Rio de Janeiro won the call for projects. And my project, my die, is what we call the Opoldo called these the laboratory floor type of project, which is a project applied to my scientific area. And Branca's project has to do with innovation structuring aspects. So we've had, had uh, joint meetings and conferences, and I'm going to bring our experiences over. So, first of all, of course, special thanks to the whole team, Professor André, Branca Almeida, the MyDai team as well, who, in fact, have been educating me in the innovation area. As I said before, this will be almost like a testimony. And much of what I have been hearing here, in fact, these correspond to feelings that I've been having from the very beginning of my career, impressions. And now I see them confirmed here today today and also in those meetings that I have just mentioned. So, 
To start with, I'm going to show you a quick vision of my professional trajectory because it does fit this program's initiative. So, medical medical school, 1990. From the beginning, I was very much interested in academic research. I started to work with animal models anatomy models, the red brain, for example. This is an atlas of the red brain. We did not have Amazon and Google, right? So, uh, so we used to make use of this kind of uh, tool. So I began my career working with rats in stereotaxis studies. Then I went on and had my master's degree in neurosciences by the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. In those years, I went through that program relatively quickly, and sometime later, I made a shift in my career, and I started to engage in more clinical activities. So I had my PhD in 2005 in neurology. My dissertation was based on neuropsychology, so in <laughs> This is where I worked more directly in the clinical area. So I went from basic animal research on to clinical research. And then in 2009, a PhD at NIH it was a neuromodulation. This is where I've had contact with stimulation of the nervous, the neural system. These were activities that I pursued after my return to Brazil. I'd like to emphasize a few aspects that, in my view, were important. The first thing is to have a broad training in sciences. I never remained exclusively in the anatomical studies, but I went on to neurology and then neuromodulation. In other words, quite a variation. This may seem a little bit dispersed, but in fact, there is nexus between all this, always around neurosciences. So I'm mentioning here the new, the stereotactic atlas as a mapping that was very, very useful for me in the remaining of my career. Another important point in this project was this experience at NIH with an example of an academic spin-off. This experience was so very interesting because it helped me to develop an intuition which, in fact, I see confirmed today very technically by the presentations that I heard. So I took part in the development of the HTTCS, the non-invasive neuromodulating techniques depend on stimulating the neural system to increase the neural activity. This has been growing very, very quickly in literature. literature. When I was there in 2009, until today, the, these articles have increased threefold and everything was dis disseminated itself to other areas, psychology, etc. At the time, 
working on the HTTPS was something new. It was a proposition by a team of researchers, and they wanted to test this on humans. And I took part of this very first test at the NIH, and it was wonderful because they went on with their initiatives, and I went on following them and monitoring their developments. When I came back to Brazil, inspired by this, I said, really, I do wish to work on this. I've already done so much in the neuroscience department that now I want to pursue this. Well, the first thing was to find so, you know, uh, establishment uh, and, uh, and create a base. And then I saw the neurosurgery service at the Pedro Ernesto University Hospital, because Professor Carlos Telles at the time was a, a reference in invasive neuromodular uh, treatment, and I wanted to do pre-op uh, treatment. You need the neurosurgeons to do the surgery afterwards. So this was my motivation. It was marriage that worked out, after all. Neurosurgeons, I learned that they are people who are extremely pragmatic and very positive. So for me, this helped immensely. With this, I created, because at the time, I don't know whether it had it had been recently created, but the Inovo Ergi, which was uh, the university's innovation department, had uh, launched a, a bid to create this. And so I created a, a lab and I won. And with this, we created LABEL, which is the uh, Laboratory for Electric Stimulation, Neuroelectric Stimulation. And I focused then on trying to find resources to execute, because I'm in an area of high tech. And so I started looking for through funding uh, mechanisms, resources to equip the lab and uh, technologies that would allow me to be up to date and have something to say in the world literature. We have resources at the lab that are estimated in around 5 million reais, which is the picture here behind. What you see here is a room in a ward, uh, the neurosurgery ward at the Pedro Ernesto University Hospital. This door here is the bathroom, and there's more equipment inside the bathroom. So this has to do with the resistance, uh, the, the difficulties in the university. And so there's lots of TNS equipment. So this is all part of the story that I'm telling. So so what can I do at LaBel? What are the techniques that I can perform? I can do the PDCS, which is stimulation. I'm not going to try not to be very technical here because I don't believe that that is the purpose here of uh, continuous current uh, stimulation and HD TDCS, which is a variant. I tested this for the first time, the researchers that are my collaborators to date, with uh, computing models, computer models, uh, I can do the TDCS in a more focal uh, way. And so I can do these two things. I can thus, as a result of these TDS, that I can do soterics today. It develops service modeling services, which is something that we also offer through our partners. 
É, para so, indivíduos que têm, por exemplo, uma lesão cerebral. Por exemplo, people um, with uh, brain injury, né? the, the electric current may be disturbed, and so you need a specific model of that patient to know where the electrodes, the leads, are going to be placed. I can use TDCS with remote assistance. This is my by dye project and very small equipment the size of a mobile phone in the person's hand. The person takes this home and works remotely or if instead of having to go all the way to the hospital or the clinic, it can they can do this from home, from their home. With uh, remote supervision, I can add another kind of uh, intervention, such as, for instance, physical exercise or physiotherapy or any kind of intervention, more simple intervention that I can do remotely. I can also perform the, the lab, uh, can also do neuromodulation with magnetic uh, stimulation. This is the same equipment that I have at the lab, the TMS equipment that can be used for different clinical conditions. I can also do central electrophysiology. I have this system in my lab with uh, another TMS uh, equipment. I can carry out electrophysiological tests that will provide me different parameters to for different uh, conditions, Alzheimer, Parkinson. Um, this kind of uh, care is not done routinely, although there are many uh, publications. This is not done routinely because these equipment are very expensive to have in your office. And there's the famous Toschinis. This is very expensive to have this, but I don't have this because it's too expensive. So it's something that the university can do away with to offer technological services. There is no private character because this is not common. The equipment is very expensive. Expensive. So expertise in this is not developed either, but we are ready to do this at LaBelle. Pre-op uh, brain mapping with TMS. I have this very close to the uh, bathroom in the ward, and it's another brand that we use, but they use it, it uses these cameras that detect uh, reflexive spheres that are placed on the patient's head, and so I can send out pulses or stimulus to uh, the person's uh, brain, and then I map uh, the response, and thus I am able to supply the surgeon with this map and indicating the best access for resecting a tumor, for instance. So with this, I can you know, make the surgery safer. The equipment, such as this one, plus TMS, costs about 900,000 reais. So it is hard unless it is uh, another kind of organization. There's expertise. I uh, was had to give orientation to a thesis. We do this routinely at the lab. Now, with all this, why should we structure a business at the university then? These are some points that I observe being approached. Why do research, what purpose and what are the goals? What would be the goals? This is the first question. It's really funny because 
desde comecei minha carreira, ever since I began my career, we have had this experience at the lab. You have enormous academic freedom in Brazilian University. You can do pretty much anything you like in terms of research, but you don't know what for and why. And, and you usually get involved in that line of research because you've either worked with that before or you just found it interesting. But I compare this, I like, for instance, I like sailing, for instance. And uh, to sail, you need wind. And the wind can blow in any one any given direction. If you want to sail in the Guanabara Bay, you will sail to whatever direction the wind is blowing. But if you if you have an objective, a goal, you can move the sail and change the, the sail to in order to be able to go to that place. But that doesn't happen in research. They just wait for CMPQ or FAPESP offer something because to do academic research is expensive in the real world. world somebody has to pay that. Who's going to fund the research? And so the problems come up. And so the person waits for these uh, funders to present this option. But uh, the economy is not doing very well, so this possibility is quite rare. And like a, a composer who composes songs uh, because they were requested to do for a given film or a soap opera or whatever, we can't do that. Obviously, my terminology here is, hasn't been very appropriate, but in some way, my activity has to generate resources so I can foster my own activity. And the second important thing is, how can I use the human resources that I am training, that I am preparing, how can I make the most of these people. Am I researching just because I like it? And then I train someone and until this person learns something that may be useful for my own line of research, and then they finish the PhD, we celebrate and toast, and then the person just leaves and that's it in order to collaborate with me, how will I work this out? How can I be a work option for those people who I train because uh, research in Brazil, scientific research in Brazil depends on the manpower of those students that we researchers train. And so these are concerns for anybody who works with research. More recently, I witnessed the emergence of a new legislation that uh, Branca had told me, Andrea, Marisa, of a new legislation seeking with the purpose of encouraging innovation. And so I see new winds blowing, going back to the sailboat analogy. But something else is reducing risk. It's interesting for the university. There is a neurostimulation service with TMS. These equipment are very so what am I going to do if I'm a inter private entrepreneur? Why am I going to spend all this money buying this equipment if I don't know whether the market's going to be interested in using it? So in a university setting, I have the safety of doing this because it is research equipment. I am performing my research and I also provide a service, a care, and by doing this, I can generate resources. So this is 
To me, it seems to make more sense. Another thing that is very interesting at the university is that there are an availability of experts from other areas. That increase, enhance my possibilities, technological possibilities of and my resources of including new techniques or even create new solutions because I need these people. These people are right next door, like, for instance, the group of technological innovation of the business administration, uh, school of business administration, who are right next door and they want to do something. And so we could do something together. On the other hand, there are a series of challenges that I have come across in order to structure or create a business, so to speak, at the university. First of all, there is a lack of clarity regarding the, the goals and the purpose of that research. Research in the past, in science, Greek philosophers began this. So people in, believe that, you know, researchers are philosophers in the 21st century, you know, those philosophers who are just thinking about people who are... Uh, there is this popular idea of what researchers and scientists are. And there are some who actually believe this. And so this, there is this lack of entrepreneurship uh, culture in the university. And when you propose something different, people don't even know what that is. So the my die idea, I, there were some initiatives. We came across barriers and political and administrative uh, barriers at the, in the university that would not allow me to do this regularly, consistently, without any legal uh, bypasses. And so that has to do with very strict uh, interpretations of the university. But the impression I get is that if you ask a university bureaucrat who should judge whether that should be done or not, the answer is going to be no, because it's safer just to say no rather than yes. So things are hard. And the rules are contradictory. There are people who actually to entrepreneurial work at the university, I see this happen a lot. And so, all, everything I said is summarized in this flowchart here that I am showing. I asked Andrea to include this slide. This is just a connection between points. There is no beginning nor end. I imagine that if you have um, cutting edge equipment, you're in a university, you can provide a better service uh, uh, mapping, a more precise mapping service. You can be more efficient you may be able to attract uh, specialized clinics and professionals who are going to get to know your service, that they, they may want to hire you, and so your income will increase. So that's good. That's good for your cash flow. This will allow you to acquire new equipment and improve this even more. And this will also enable you to participate in a greater number of fairs and congresses and conferences. And so, uh, and also academic partnerships will lead to gains in terms of trainings and teachings, and this is important. And all this is good for research because you're going to have more clinical cases and you'll be able to carry out your 
service uh, provision or your research and once you have training and research you will be able to use these data and publish more and there's this feedback here this feedback loop here and so we are i'm talking about a business dynamic for one research lab this is what this whole business is about the uh, my die call or bid it uh, it's recent it's a master's and a doctorate uh, academic master's and doctorate uh, program for innovation fosters innovative projects encourages the creation of partner networks and it requests the demand is the participation of a partner company, which in my case is Sotetix Medical. And it was through this that we are proposing a project for remote assistance. Uh, so there, sorry, remote assistance with TDCS and physical activity in patients having chronic pain. So Terex Medical will furnish the equipment as the counterpart, and the project will be a pilot for the development of a telemedicine and telerehabilitation service provision system that may allow for additions of new services and solutions. To formalize the business in the university environment, while we have been debating the challenges and other issues, basically it is important to have a support team to implement the project, and this is what you see here, these names, Branca's project, for example, is precisely to make viable the legal framework inside the university, the administrative framework, in order to make a spin-off viable. So, in a certain way, it is already a collaboration model. It is also important for the university, well, I already touched on the issue around the risk, the product or service may not work or it may take some time to give some kind of return. So, it is difficult when you speak about innovation, it's very hard to make any market forecasts, estimates, expenses, revenues. You don't know, you have no previous experience. It is an innovative business. You have no uh, history for that. But even if everything goes wrong, it is still interesting because in the worst case scenario, you're still generating knowledge and you're training qualified personnel. Even if this business does not is not achieved, one is producing ideas and staff in order to attempt it again, either maybe to mature the ideas or proposition for the future. And again, it is an opportunity for us to make adjustments to the business model. If you're not in at the university, these things are more challenging because you are in an environment where you have at university it's not like a business where you need profit otherwise you're going to go bankrupt not at the university when you work on a piece of research you will take advantage of all your setup even if it's not successful immediately and this will help you start a new business in other words, it is a game for society. This is what I had. I'm sorry, maybe I spoke too much. I exceeded my time a little bit. But again, thank you, Andrea, 
Branca and all. Thank you all for this invitation. Thank you. I like to thank the attendance of these brilliant speakers and their wonderful presentations. It was our expectation that these presentations would be brilliant, and they were so. We have a few questions. Some others will probably reach us because they're going to be collected from Google. But Paula Gonzaga, who is the director at Nidideck, the person who actually helped us in organizing this event, the first question is this, and it is addressed to Juliana. Juliana, how can we access your dissertation? Because everybody is saying that this thesis is the big star currently, which made me think, will she even publish this in a book? In this case, of course, the dissertation itself can only be accessed when it is made available at the EBICT. So Paula wants to know when will it be made available? Sorry. I am very happy with this comment. Of course, I need to see because this is already in the graduate program repository. There are different articles. Actually, my professor is here attending. And of course, we do have a project and we wish to publish this in a book. However, Paula, at this point in time, maybe you can we can contact each other this is my email address and i can send you a version of my work the second question is a broad question and is addressed to all speakers marisa says based on your experience how can universities incentivize spin-off creation in other words, how can you, what can you do to have these companies, these businesses created? Eckes actually already talked about this, said that his big opportunity was Maidai. And I told Leopoldo this, it was very, he was very happy about it because he was also involved with Maidai, but the question is this, how is it possible to encourage spin-off generation? I don't know whether somebody wants to answer because of the weak, the poor connection, I'm going to turn off my camera, but this is what I was uh, telling you when I made my presentation. There are different issues that have been that have to be faced there is not one single action that will be the silver bullet to solve these problems there are different actions first of all the university must approach the market they must get a uh, close closer to the market then you have to foster the entrepreneurial culture. In other words, bring the entrepreneurial education to the scientists who do not get that kind of education themselves. In the third place, you can create a set of regulations that will encourage the spin-off and start-up creation. Another point which I believe has not yet been approached here is that the incentive system for teachers is still focused on scientific production. But if you make any changes there, you can also uh, encourage the creation of spin-offs. Very well. Go ahead. 
Está aberto, Leopoldo, pode falar, se você quiser. É, completando só o gancho, assim, eu achei interessante essa, essa, essa colocação. Acho que via de regra não tem fórmula pronta, sabe? It is true, there is no silver bullet when we are working with innovation. We must incorporate innovation and accept certain risks. We were discussing my die with Professor Branca, and we asked how could we do what models should we use. In five years ago, we carried out an experience with our dear colleague Patricia, who is here today, with the ABC University. It was called Academic and Entrepreneurial Program. But what was the logic behind it? It was the challenge was this incentive to the industry. This project started out small, and it ended up working and being successful. Today, it is working at the national level. I was very happy, but right at the beginning, it was just being brave enough to begin this and work hard. So the spin-off issue is very much linked to this, being brave and being aware that the country needs to innovate needs research. So small steps, small actions by everyone uh, will contribute for the, to move forward. So this is my idea. You have to encourage little initiatives, which in the end, in the overall context, will give better results. This is a very quick addition to what Leopoldo was this is a joint effort, isn't it? Even within the university, I myself work in the innovation core. So I believe it is a set of actions in our department. We are one place that offers support, but there's a whole chain that must work. First of all, this must be in the institution's DNA. This must be incorporated as one mission. And then you go on building practices, strategies, policies. This is done through the effort uh, of all. We have already received a warning. I see that our colleague Sergio Paulino are already coming in for the next panel. We still had one question, but we might talk to the speakers later. The question is, where could one find these legal instruments that have been so successful in your universities that could help other universities to reach this spin-off creation goals more quickly. I will leave this question to you and then we can go ahead and discuss this another time. And we will add this because, of course, we are going to prepare a book with all of this material. In fact, we are even going to have to ask you your permission to use your PowerPoints, not only PowerPoint presentations, but also your talk, your narrative. And maybe this one question can also be answered in your replies. Let's not occupy more time. Our colleagues for the next panel are here. Again, thank you so much for this wonderful panel. Thank you for your availability, for your organization. Everything was wonderful. See you later. And I give the floor to Sergio. Tchau, tchau. A gente agradece muito a participação de todos também. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.